Welcome everyone to the D20 Play YouTube channel. This is Tom Christie. Today we're going to look at what I learned prepping and running the Nightland. This is a D&D &D Eberron Oracle Award Adventure and it is DDALEB-01 written, designed by Sean Merwin and optimized specifically for level 1 characters. So let's take a look at the uh, Roll20 game board I have here. So i got the game board set up here with uh, map of Eberron, some Eberron background information, a uh, map of Salvation, which is provided in the adventure, and a Salvation broadsheet. They have one of these for each adventure, so these are cool. I share these with the players ahead of time to kind of entice them and get them interested and ready for the adventure. Next I have the salvage board. These are the three salvage board postings that come into play during the adventure. And then I have the maps for the adventure. And the maps for the adventure come from a company called STM Roleplay. They're available on Dungeon Masters Guild. I have no affiliation with them, uh, but they do work out pretty good, so I use those for this adventure. They also have one that is for a bundle, the complete tier one. has everything from the first four adventures included in that. And they have one for the um, Epic, which you can now run. So yeah, that's a, a useful tool if you like to run with maps, which I love maps. So, getting into the adventure, there are three pieces of knowledge in the adventure that I'd like to share ahead of time with the players, specifically players that have the skills that uh, would know stuff about this knowledge so that they can share it organically during the adventure. The first one, and these are all on um, the printer event friendly version, the page number references I'm making of the adventure, and also there will be spoilers here plenty, so if you're going to play this, please don't watch this till you play. Okay, on page 7 there is a bit of knowledge about the Moorland, so I mine that for some stuff to share with players with Arcana skill. On page... Let's see here... It's actually not really uh, singled out, but there's an interesting piece of information on page 14. This effigy that the players run into is one of the mini forms of the crawling queen. So I put together some information with those players that have knowledge of religion that they could share about the crawling queen that they might be triggered by seeing this. And then last but not least there is the Order of the Emerald Claw on page 16. So I shared that with people with history skill and like soldier backgrounds etc. So there's the information there. And then I'd like to do ahead of time um, rules for insight checks, or if I can't do it ahead of time, I do it in secret, but I like to do it ahead of time. I take whoever has the highest insight. If more than one person has training and insight, then I give that person advantage, and I pre-roll checks on anything that might give a tell during a role-playing encounter, and that includes Bellalur and Zodar and Ebenezer in this adventure. All right, so the adventure starts out in the Grey Beyond Tavern, which is a rough-and-tumble tavern in the town called Salvation. There's a little gnome hermit that gives some background information about the three dragons. And I just, if I was running these again, I'd make a side note. I didn't include him in any of the other tier one adventures, but he's a neat little guy. And I would again if I could. Then there is Callie, of course, a friendly face. For Callie, um, I might give this information to the players ahead of time if I had thought about it. And at the very least, give them some time in game so I don't like put them on the spot to come up with why they know Callie but give them a chance to come up with the reason they might know Kelly, and then as a last resort, use the random rolls there. All right, and then they go off into the moorland. On page seven is a blurb for entering the moorland. It's very, very uh, cinematic. Definitely read that when the players get to it. It's put there because it could happen in any of the three encounters or three mini adventures because they can come in any order. Just don't forget to do that. The first of the three adventures is called a Rolling Stone. And here the players start out in Salvation at the Salvage Market, talking to a goblin named Bellalur. And she has a tell that Insight might give her, give the players. It says this job goes far beyond mere business for her. So something along those lines as they're talking to her, and then they can try and persuade her for more information. I really tried to highlight the, uh, the description of the goblin the players are going to go after, this uh, Garunda, and specifically the tattoo on her shoulder, because that could come into play later in the encounter. Um, but unfortunately no group I ran this through picked up on that, but definitely trying to highlight that, make a note to highlight that when you're running it. Then the players go off into the moorland, 
on page 8, they get to a, a body there, and they have a DC-10 Wisdom Medicine check. Whenever I see a DC-10 check, I know that, it, you know, someone's going to make a DC-10 check out of six rolls. So I just look for who's trained in that skill and just tell them the information. And if no one's trained, then I let them, you know, make the checks and dig a little bit more. Then the encounter in this first part has crystal drakes in it, and they have pack tactics. I started them surrounding the party. So I I ran this for a larger group or a more experienced group, and I ran it kind of a little bit harder than average. So I put three of these guys surrounding the party, and if the party engages them all, then they stay and fight where they're at. But if one of them's left unengaged, then I would have them use that pack tactics, move together so they could fight together, and that makes them quite a bit tougher. Then the party moves on to the uh, depot. I have them start here. This is on the GM later, the circle, so they don't see the circle. But I have them start there. I say the lead person is about equal with this pylon. You're heading to the east, you know, deeper into the moorland. You're coming to this depot where ahead you can see a stone way down about 200 feet ahead. You see a iron defender ahead, and I read the description that's in the adventure. And then, once they've seen that, I have this lightning rail come into view. And I just made this on a image editing software. I use Photoshop, but you can use any, you know, any free one to make it slightly transparent, more ghost-like. And then I tell them it's moving at a speed of 20, so it's going to go 40 feet every round. It's going to crush whatever's down that rail here in, you know, five rounds. It takes about five rounds to get from that point to hitting the goblin. At the midway point, I put a little mark on the GM layer for me to remember that this is where the Iron Defender will attack. So as soon as someone crosses this pylon, the Iron Defender will come to the attack. Until then, it just readies an attack. So there's that encounter. It was pretty um, pretty intense, and um, there's some some uh, suspense there for the players as they're rushing to beat the train to get to Bellalure. I like that better than them coming from the opposite direction. kind of just gives them a little bit more, oh, this is you know, dangerous, and we're in a race here. we got to beat it to, to Bellalure, or to Garunda, and get her off the tracks. Then later, there is an encounter with some cockatrices. I was leery of this one. I thought it would be too difficult, since the cockatrices can petrify, but uh, no one was ever petrified, so it was not as difficult as I thought it would, so I'd, I'd leave it just at the difficulty level it's at. It worked out good. All right, so that's the first encounter. That's a fun one with that ghost train coming out to the party. The second encounter, uh, first there's some in-town um, role-playing, you get to meet Mother Johanna. Straightforward, nothing hidden there. Then you have to talk to a couple salvage brokers. There's the change thing Zodar and the salvage broker Dreyev. And Zodar is hiding some stuff. The tell there, um, the players could discern that he is lying. Um, so I just kind of did that and how he had this discussion with the players. And then Dreyev's got a really uh, obvious appearance, so I'll definitely highlight this. He lost his nose in the war. Uh, he wears a magic filter in its place. He's got breathing apparatus that hisses and rasps, giving a nasal inflection when he talks. So that was pretty neat. Pretty neat. After they talk to those two guys, they figure out where um, the thief went that Mother Johanna tells them about. They go into the moorland to try and track down this thief, and they come upon this scene here. There's the very disturbing corpse sculpture in the form of a scorpion. So I found a picture, I think this is a, I think it's a Pathfinder monster, so just do a Pathfinder scorpion search and hopefully you'll come across this. That's where I found that. I also put its auras on the map there because this thing has an aberrant ground, or gibbering aura is the first one, that's 20 feet, and an aberrant ground aura, which is 10 feet. And I make these auras only visible to me until the uh, players get close, so I have the auras as players don't see him, and then I change it to see him when the players are close enough and have interacted with it and know that it's there. And then there's a Dolgrim around it. This thing's got a vicious attack. Its bite attack does 5d6 damage, and if it kills a creature, it absorbs it into the sculpture. So that's uh, pretty scary stuff there. Uh, the scaling has us add an extra one of these for a strong group, which could be as simple as six first level characters. I would definitely instead increase the number of Dolgrim, because six first level characters would uh, be in pretty big danger fighting two of those things. I drew the cannon barrel overhead in this gray outline, and I describe it when the players get there, so they know if they can crash it down, where it would crash down on. So that's handy. 
yeah, and it's very much just a straightforward one one combat encounter. This is where you can really heighten the description here. This thing having the form one of the forms of the crawling queen. If there's anyone with a religion, they can share that information with the party, saying, "Oh my God, that's that's what we're seeing," and then they can return back to salvation. And this encounter and the previous one both they should get a hero point for if they complete. The third encounter takes place in the scrapyard just outside of Salvation, and the players talk to a commoner, Ebenezer, who's also hiding something, so an insight check there will tell them that he's uh, scared and that he's maybe not wholly telling the truth. Unfortunately, he doesn't know necessarily what the truth is, so when he comes clean, it's still not the truth, but it's what he knows of the truth. Okay, then he'll send the players into the tunnels below the scrapyard where they will come to this encounter here. They should smell the formaldehyde when they get to the door, and when they can see what's beyond there, they'll know. They should know it's flammable. I have just set up over here a uh, little flame in case they set these piles of bodies on fire. I had one group set them on fire and draw out the uh, emerald flame from the next room. That worked well for them. The next room has in here a mad doctor and five emerald claw bandits, and. That's a pretty easy encounter. The, the strong version of it replaces them all with thugs. I think that's a huge jump in strength. So instead I replace a couple of them with thugs. That worked out pretty well. That was a good balanced encounter for a, a party of six characters or you know maybe there's one or two second level characters. If there's a bunch of third or fourth level characters then yeah definitely go up to the thugs and eight thugs even at very strong. So that's that encounter. The party can pull him back out and then they come back to find Ebenezer to tell him what they found. And they come to the scrapyard and they'll have him start along the top edge here. They'll see Ebenezer's body, they'll see the bell that they have to ring earlier. Then there's a couple of assassins. This is a really, really difficult encounter. And because these assassins, they have longbows and they have multi-attack where they can shoot their longbows twice. So that is two attacks at range, you know, doing good damage, averaging seven points damage. So two shots are going to drop any character. And they hit pretty well. They're plus, what, plus four to hit. So that's pretty dangerous the way it's written there. I've had uh, one death and one party almost total probably kill here. They had like one character left out of six still standing at the end. So next time I ran this, I might have one of them be like up here, say, oh, they were caught off guard when the party came, and they might, you know, party can get to him quickly and reduce the uh, danger fast that way. But a good, a really high intense last combat, if that's the last one in the, for your group, if they do it in the order of the way they're posted. Then the law arrives, the war forged, and here the DM's got to make a little decision. I didn't, didn't really research how I should do this beforehand, but uh, there's a legacy event if the party publicly accuses Aurelion of being involved in this. So I made the judgment call that telling the uh, sheriff about it is not publicly accusing her, but actually going and talking to her and confronting her would count for that. And then that's the end of the adventure. So three little mini adventures. In the adventure, there's a little uh, conclusion blurb. I like those at the end on page 19. The uh, monsters are pretty difficult when it comes to uh, the crystal drakes are pretty strong. If they can get to where they team up, they can drop a character pretty fast. The corpse sculpture is like uh, it's like feast or famine on that one. If it hits, it's going to do a lot of damage in a hurry. And then the really difficult encounter, I'd say, would be the the scouts across the the scrapyard. Which you know, surprisingly, I didn't think of that one being the most difficult one until I ran it. All right, then we can look at the adventure record. I love these adventure records in everyone. I would love to see this become kind of a more common thing across Adventure League. So they can get, players can get a level, they get all these rewards here, choose one of these rewards here, and several very cool legacy events, including Powerful Enemy, which is really neat how it works. And Grateful Goblin, players can learn Goblin, they can get a Wizard Spell, all good stuff. So that is the first adventure in the Eberron Oracle of War campaign. We're having a great time playing it. I'm running it for three different groups right now. And I can't wait to get into the Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4 adventures for this campaign. Keep up the good work, at those guys that are and gals that are working on it and editing it and putting it out there for us. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you get a chance to play it and run it. And uh, I'll be doing another one of these, What I Learned, 
discussions on um, A Voice in the Machine, which is the second adventure. Look for that soon. Thanks for joining me, and uh, happy gaming.